Good morning and welcome to Cornerstone. We are so glad that you are here with us today. If you could please find your seats, it's time for the morning announcements. If this is your first or second time here at Cornerstone, we'd love to have you visit us at the guest center so we can meet you, get to know you a little bit better, and give you a gift to show you how much we appreciate that you are here with us today. Here at Cornerstone, we love God and we love others. One of the ways we do that is through our giving. This past Tuesday, we took part in the Bethalto School Community Event where we ran some bouncers, we hung out with the community, we had a great time. And it's because of your faithful giving and because of those who give their time that we're able to take part in events like this and give back to our community and be a part of our community, which we find so valuable. And because you give, we can serve. If you'd like to give, you can do so online using Church Center. If you don't have Church Center, make sure you check it out in your app store on your smart device. Or you can drop it off in the giving boxes in the back of the auditorium. Next week is Mother's Day. So moms, get your kids. Kids, get your moms. Everybody, do not miss out. We're going to have cupcakes. We're going to have a photo booth. We're going to have special guests. It's going to be a great time. We can't wait to see you there. This Wednesday night, make sure you're here for our worship and prayer service. It's going to be a great time to draw closer to God. Also, if you have kids or teenagers, we have Awana and Uncommon going on at the same time. So make sure you're here Wednesday at 7 p.m. And that's it for your announcements today. For more information or to stay up to date with what's going on here at Cornerstone, make sure you check out the Church Center app or come out here to the lobby and grab yourself a paper bulletin. We love you. Have an amazing day. Good morning, Cornerstone. How are we? Good. Let's go ahead and stand. How many have a testimony this morning? Amen. Let's sing about what the Lord has done for us. Thank you, Jesus. I saw Satan fall like lightning. And I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven And I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace be on my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. Yeah. This is my testimony from death to life. Rewrite my story, I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. No. Greater things still to come. Oh, I believe. If I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things still to come. This is my 
testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony Oh, I'm alive This is my testimony From death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'm testified other people. This is what the Lord did for me. Let's see what he can do for you. So Father God, I just give you, um, I just give you my heart right now, Lord. Lord, I think in this place, we just want you to move freely, Lord. And, and we want to, we want to remember God. We don't want to forget all of the things that you've done for us. We want to remember how good and how faithful you are, Lord. So today we just give it all to you. We surrender, and Lord, we just we just remember who you are. Thank you, Jesus. God of Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Time and time again, you have proven you do just what you say. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart know when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great is your faithfulness. setting same I will praise your name oh great is your faithfulness to me away your word remains the same yeah your history can prove there's nothing you can do your faithfulness
God, we thank you for your faithfulness to us. And we recognize as we sing a song like this, so often we are not faithful to you. And so God, today we just, as a church family, we gather here and we just collectively admit and confess the times and the ways that we've been unfaithful to you. You are so good, you are so faithful, you are so holy, you are just, but you are gracious and you are kind towards us. And so we call out to you now and we say, oh God, that you are so faithful to us, help us to be more faithful in return. Transform our hearts, make us more like you. God, I pray through the circumstances that we're walking through, some of us are just really walking through difficult times right now. God, I pray that we would see your faithful, steady hand guiding and leading us through those situations. For these needs that are represented in our congregation, God, we pray for some, God, we know that you can and you, you will re, you turn around and you will heal and you will restore and you will transform and you will change the circumstance. But other times, God, you will change us and you will use us through those circumstances. Whatever it is today, we want to submit ourselves to our faithful king. We want to put our hope in you. And so now, Father, as we've taken time to acknowledge your goodness and your faithfulness and your worthiness, as we prepare our hearts to look at your word, I pray that you would challenge us and you would change us and you would convict us. We want to be more like Jesus. We want to be the sons and daughters that you've called us to be. So speak to our hearts today, we pray. Transform us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. Uh, you can take a seat. Thanks for being here today. And thanks, worship team and Pastor Abby and our tech team and hosts and donut people and all the other things that go on, our kids ministry. We so appreciate each one of you. Well, today is Communion Sunday, and we have the tables in the back with the communion items. There, are, there is a gluten-free option. If you've got the writing on the top, um, it should say gluten-free. You can check that if you need one of those. Uh, and if you need to grab one of those, go ahead and slip to the back and get one of those now if you are not able to on the way in. Um, and sometimes we've got folks that will pass them out, so slip your hand up if you need one. I just want to say, uh, before we get into the message today, I want to reiterate what we saw in the video there at the beginning in the announcement video. Man, we had the privilege as a church of serving our community for the Bethalto Community Schools. Uh, we put on this event with our inflatables, and several of you helped out with that. And I just like pointing those things out because, because you give, we can serve. Uh, because you're investing in the ministry of Cornerstone, we can make a difference in that way, and we can share the, the, the love and the hope of Jesus uh, through our actions in our community. So I just want to say thank you for that, and thanks to each of you who helped uh, volunteer and set up and tear down for that. Well, one of my favorite shows growing up was a show called Saved by the Bell. Anybody else? Anybody else? I got a yes over here, of course. Anybody else Saved by the Bell fans? Come on. What a great, silly show in the late 80s, early 90s. Um, it was your typical, like, early 90s sitcom. It was over the top and silly and lighthearted. Uh, the main character, or one of the main characters, was Zach Morris. And throughout the series, Zach would do this thing where he would break the fourth wall. Uh, and what that means is uh, the, the, the action would stop, and he would look at the camera, and he would talk to you, the viewer. And oftentimes, Zach would do this by calling a timeout. We have a picture of him calling a timeout there. And uh, when he did these timeouts, uh, most of the time, he was explaining what was going on. Sometimes he was talking about what he was thinking or feeling. Uh, other times he was just setting up the situation of what was going to happen or what did took place. It was giving context. So when you have a narrative and you've got a story, uh, breaking the fourth wall is a way that you can give information to the audience so that they can understand what's going on, get like some insider information so they know what's going on. You know, I don't know about you, but sometimes in life, I kind of wish I had someone break the fourth wall and explain to me the chaos of what's going on in life, right? Uh, today, we are in the second week of a sermon series called Kingdom Come, and this sermon series is covering Matthew chapters 24 and 25. If you've been part of our church for a while, uh, you know, and if you, you haven't been, uh, now you will know that we have just been making our way verse by verse, line by line through Matthew's gospel, and we find ourselves here uh, really in the last week of Jesus's life near the end of the gospel, and um, what we're seeing in this, in this chapter here, in Matthew chapter 24, probably the most difficult chapter to understand and to interpret in all of Matthew's gospel. 
gospel, we see Jesus speaking to his disciples and he's, he's sitting on the Mount of Olives. We're gonna be looking at Matthew chapter 24, verses 15 through 28 today. So if you've got your Bibles or your apps, you can open those to that location. Now, in the previous verses we looked at last week, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple. And uh, what we're going to see here in our text today is that Matthew's going to break the fourth wall for us. He's going to talk to us, the readers here. So in the previous section, Jesus predicted the destruction of the temple, and the disciples did not have a category for this. They didn't understand, and for them, the destruction of the temple, it just meant the end of the world. And so they asked Jesus two questions that Jesus answers here in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. It's these two questions. When will the temple be destroyed? And what will be the sign of your coming, Jesus, and the end of the age? Now, these, these questions are very straightforward. Like, tell us when and give us some signs. Just give us the details. And in our kind of modern Western mindset, that's what we expect. That's what we want. Jesus, just tell us plainly. But Jesus doesn't do that. Instead, what he's going to do all throughout this chapter is he's going to speak in what's technically called apocalyptic or prophetic uh, language. It's very highly figurative language. And the example I use to kind of illustrate what's going on here is, is, is a picture that we showed last week. It's a picture of a mountain range. Okay, so when the prophets in the scriptures looked at, uh, when they saw something, they had a vision or the prophecy, oftentimes what they were doing, like we have this mountain range here, we have a, a range here, a peak here, and another peak, and then another one off in the distance. Oftentimes what the prophets did is they would talk about one of these peaks that were in the front, and that was like the idea of their message. But they don't just talk about that, they kind of paint that event in light of the whole, the whole range. And so the challenge that we have here in Matthew chapter 24 is that Jesus is talking about an event that's going to happen in about 40 years. And so he's talking about like one of these peaks that's in the front, but he's painting it with all of the other peaks in view as well. So all the other future things and ultimately the end of the world as well. So when we read through this chapter, we ask the question, are you talking about this thing that's happening in 40 years from Jesus or are you talking about the end of the world? And the answer to that is yes, <laughs> Jesus. Now I don't, I wish he didn't do that. I wish he would just tell us plainly, but this is how he's chosen to communicate this to us. Um, I got a text from Gary Payne. Some of you know Gary Payne. Gary uh, Payne is a, a part of our church. He's one of the smartest guys I know. But he talked about this passage in, uh, the, we, they call it the Olivet Discourse because Jesus is on the Mount Olivet talking. And he says it's almost as if Jesus is talking about these future events. He's kind of gazing off into the distance. And you know if you're thinking about something, you kind of just pop over from one discussion to another. That's kind of what Jesus is doing here in the text. He's jumping back and forth. So I say all that to say that it's difficult for us to parse all of Jesus's words, but he is speaking about something that's going to be happening soon. It's, it starts here in verse 15. So when you see standing in the holy place, quote, the abomination that causes desolation, end quote, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Okay, so this is not a full sentence because he's going to continue on with some instructions here in a minute, but this is a mess of a verse, okay? There's a lot going on right here. Last week, uh, when we looked at the text before this, we saw that Jesus gave his followers some instructions on what they should do and how they should live in troubling times. And so now he's going to continue to give them instructions, but the instructions that he's going to give that we're going to look at here, they're in light of this thing that he's talking about, this abomination that causes desolation. All right, that is a very kind of strange phrase, uh, but as Jesus says here, it comes from the prophet Daniel. Now, if you go back into your Old Testament and look at the book of Daniel and you read through the book of Daniel, you'll find this idea of this abomination that causes desolation. You'll find it four times throughout his book of prophecy. And that prophecy that he's making about this abomination that causes desolation, it's talking about a king who is from the north who's going to come down to Jerusalem and abolish the daily sacrifice and desecrate the temple. So Daniel's prophesying about this king coming down and doing this, and this was God's judgment that was going to take place. Now, that prophecy that Daniel made, it came to pass in the year 167 B.C., 
Antiochus Epiphanes conquered Jerusalem. He set up a pagan altar in the temple and he offered sacrifices on it. Some of the sacrifices that he offered were pigs, which were unclean animals. And in doing this, he completely defiled the temple. So Daniel speaks of this abomination that causes desolation and this event occurred in the temple and the temple was defiled there. Now, I want you to notice here in our verse that Matthew has broken the fourth wall to talk to us. He says here, let the reader understand. And you see those long dashes there. Those long dashes, this is because I like to be a nerd. Those long dashes actually have a name. They're called M dashes, E-M dashes. Uh, Some translations that you have might put them in uh, parentheses, okay? And the idea is, is that Matthew is writing here and he's talking and Jesus mentions this thing that Daniel says. And then Matthew's writing to us and he turns to us, the readers, and he says, look, understand What's going on here? I want to point something out to you. I'm pointing out to you that Jesus is using the language of Daniel and what he's predicting to happen in the future. So let's go back to this picture of the mountain here. So it's almost like this. If we're going to take a look of, uh, as the, the timeline going this way, Jesus is talking about events that are going to happen in about 40 years, and then he's going to talk about the end of time. But what Matthew is saying is he's saying, let the reader understand that Jesus is actually using some of the language from Daniel here. So the abomination that causes desolation, this thing that was, uh, that was just devastating for the people of God that happened here, that same kind of language... Matthew's saying Jesus is using that language to talk about this event that's happening in 40 years and then the end of the world. So what, so what is this event that Jesus is talking about that's coming ahead? We've, we've talked about this the last couple of weeks, but it's the destruction of the temple that was going to occur. In 66 AD, there was a Jewish revolt that began, and that resulted in several armed conflicts against the Romans. And those conflicts escalated over time, and eventually Jerusalem was placed under siege by a man named Titus. The siege lasted six months, and eventually the city was conquered, the temple was burned down, and it was torn down then in 70 AD. Now, this is the main focus of our text today. Jesus is going to talk about instructions for these believers and what they should do in this time frame from about 66 to 70 AD. Now, what we're going to do is this, is we're going to survey this text and we're going to look at what Jesus told them and what that meant for them. We're going to kind of give some context. We're going to kind of fly through the verses here and see what it meant then. And then what we're going to do is we're going to apply it to our lives today. Just kind of, you know, as an aside, this is the way we should be reading scripture. We don't just pick up the Bible and say, what do I think this means to me now? What we need to do is we need to root it in its context, in the history. We need to understand what it meant in order to understand what it means, okay? So that's what we're gonna do today. We're gonna try to look at what it meant and then pull some ideas from there that we can understand for ourselves today. So remember, Jesus says in verse 15, when the abomination that causes desolation, when, you, when this happens, when you see this, when the Romans are coming, when all of this conflict is taking place, verse 16, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Okay, So normally in those days, if an army was coming after you, you would run to the fortified city. Uh, That's why you had a city. In fact, Jerusalem was up on a hill, on a mountain. It was very well fortified. But Jesus tells his followers to do something different than what they would normally expect. He says, don't go to the city. He goes, run out into the mountains. Uh, This is actually good advice. (laughs) The mountains provided ideal shelter, and they were hard to navigate for large armies. And so uh, the Romans, beside that, they were concerned with the city and the temple. And so those who heeded Jesus' words, they were actually able to get away, and they were spared. They They were able to get to safety when others couldn't. Verse 17, Jesus continues. So he says, get out, get out, and leave. Verse 17, let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Now, homes in the first century, very different than our homes here today. Homes in the first century had a flat roof with an exterior stairwell on the side. They didn't have stairwells on the inside of their house. And so what Jesus is saying here is he's saying, look, your need to to flee is so great that when you leave your roof and you go down the outside of your house, don't even go back in to grab any other provisions. Don't make a snack for the road. Don't grab any extra clothes. Just get out of there. Leave as soon as you can. Better to lose some possessions than for you to lose your life. Verse 18, the theme continues. He says, let no one in the field 
go back to get their cloak. Now, the cloak was an outer garment that was worn, and it was a very, very important piece of clothing for the people in that time. Because at night, it would get very cold, and oftentimes, that cloak was their only way to warm themselves in the evening. In fact, the Old Testament law uh, taught the people that if someone owed someone else money, uh, the creditor could not take the cloak from the debtor because it was that important that they needed to have that in order to, be, to not be cold at night and to be able to be warm and those kinds of things. And so this is a very important uh, piece of clothing. And what would happen often is the men would go out to the fields to work in the cool of the morning, uh, and they'd, you know, as it got hotter, they'd take that outer cloak off and they'd put it on the side of the field. And so what Jesus is saying is he's saying, look, when, if, if you see the army coming or when you see these things start to take place, don't even go to the side of the field to grab that cloak. As important as it is, just get out of there and leave. Verse 19, how dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. I mean, this seems pretty obvious. This is just, you know, practically speaking, fleeing on foot quickly like this would be difficult for uh, pregnant or nursing uh, mothers. Uh, but Jesus' statement here isn't just about those who would flee. It's also about those who would remain in the city and not listen to his words. Uh, there's a historian from the first century, a guy named Josephus, and he describes the siege that the Romans did on Jerusalem there. And it's absolutely horrific what took place. Starvation, death, desperation, cannibalism. It was awful, awful, awful what took place there. And so Jesus, Jesus is warning and he's saying, look, it's gonna be a difficult time. Verse 20, pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Now, when we think about the winter, we think about snow and ice, right? You know, we think about that kind of thing. But in the Middle East, it's more an issue of rain. Uh, the rains come down very heavily and very suddenly. And oftentimes, uh, places that you could pass through are all of a sudden flooded and you're unable to do that. Uh, so, certainly, it, it is cooler at that time. But the rains are actually uh, make it sometimes impossible to even uh, pass through certain areas. And then he says, pray that it wouldn't take place on the Sabbath. Uh, traveling on the Sabbath could be difficult for a variety of reasons. Um, some people might be hes hesitant because they don't want to break the Sabbath laws and, and work on the Sabbath. They had rules about how far you could uh, travel. Uh, or perhaps the gates of the city would be closed or they wouldn't be able to get their animals out to be able to travel on. Uh, the key is, is that the, the Sabbath would be a difficult or challenging time. And you might even be noticed if you were fleeing at that point too. Verse 21. From then, for then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now, and never to be equaled again. Okay, so this is one of those moments where Jesus has been pretty clearly, when we looked at that picture of the mountains, he's talking about that, that mountain of this event in, in 70 AD. But now in this verse, he kind of seems like he's talking about the whole range, isn't it? Because he's talking about a great time of distress that's unequaled. Well, we know that it was pretty bad in Jerusalem during that siege, but we know there's been horrific things that have happened throughout history up to this point. And so Jesus is now moving from the, on this verse, talking about kind of the broader picture. We see this throughout the rest of the New Testament. In 2 Thess uh, Thessalonians, the Apostle Paul writes about the great distress that will happen at the end of time. The book of Revelation paints a picture of great distress and tribulation at the end of time. And so Jesus is kind of mixing, he's kind of talking about the whole picture here now. And now in verse 22, if those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. So this is a, kind of like a proverb. It's a proverbial statement. It's a way of saying that God is in control. Now, in our, in our, la, our text last week, Jesus essentially said, it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better, right? It's going to seem like the wicked are winning. The bad guys are, it seems like they're going to be in charge and they're going to take over. But this verse reminds us that God's hand is still guiding everything. The wicked are going to be defeated and God's grace is going to be shown to and through his people as they prayerfully and faithfully endure. Okay, I got a few more verses and then we're gonna get to some application here. Verses 23 through 28. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. 
See, I have told you ahead of time. So if anyone tells you, uh, there he is out in the wilderness, do not go out. Or here he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as lightning that comes from the east is visible even in the west, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. Wherever there is a carcass, there, there the vultures will gather. So again, last week, Jesus warned about false prophets. And again, Jesus is warning about false prophets and false messiahs. Uh, last week, we talked about how there were many people that came onto the scene and claimed to be uh, messiahs. But here, Jesus is clarifying something. He's saying that these, these teachers, these false messiahs, they're not just going to say they're a false messiah. They're going to say that they can do signs and wonders also. Uh, again, the first uh, century historian Josephus talks about these people. There were people that showed up in that time that said, hey, I'm going to part this river. I'm going to do this act. Watch me do this. They proclaimed, they professed to be uh, a miracle working Messiah. The main point here, though, in this section is that the return of the Son of Man is going to be obvious to everyone. You know, you don't need to look for him because you can't hide lightning. <laughs> when, when, when there's a lightning strike, even oftentimes when you're in a building, you can see the lightning strike, right? You can hear the thunder take place. And so the idea here is that there's not going to be any people with like certain insider information. When, when Jesus returns, everyone is going to know. And even that final verse about the vultures and the carcasses, it's very grim, but it's making the same point that the lightning image is making. The same way that people can see vultures kind of circling around the sky over a dead animal, it's going to be the same way when the Son of Man returns. It's going to be visible and we're going to recognize, oh, he's come to bring judgment to the dead and corrupt world. That's the point that Jesus is, is making there. So, okay. So we talked about, like, what do we do with all this, right? This is like some strange stuff that we've been talking about today. And it seems very specific in particular to this event in 70 AD. So how do we kind of parse this? How do we figure this out? Well, as I was reading through this and studying, I, I, I identified three different kind of categories of Jesus' instructions here that I think are helpful for us to consider today. You know, we are on that picture. We're past the 70 AD event but there have been and there are mountain ranges ahead of us. And there's a big uh, peak at the end of time that we still have to look forward to. And so Jesus' words to his disciples in the first day, they echo out to us and they show us how we should live as well. I see three different ideas here. First is obedience. The second is prayer. And the third is discernment. So let's take a look at these one at a time each. First is obedience. We see this in verses 16 through 18. That's the section where Jesus gave simple, practical, direct instructions to his disciples. Flee to the mountains. Don't go back inside your house. Don't get your cloak. Just get out and run. Now, we know, um, I know a lot of history today, but uh, there's another historian, Eusebius. And Eusebius wrote about this event. And he talked about how many believers did heed Jesus' instructions. And they left and they were spared from the horrors that took place during the siege. But the point is, is that they had to make the decision to trust Jesus at his word. And this was not an easy choice. Again, it would not make sense for them to run to the hills when they could just stay in their fortified city. This was not an easy choice. I mean, for many of them, they wanted to stand and fight against the pagans. They, or or they, at least they would say, let's stay in the city where it's safe. So leaving was not an easy choice. They would have to leave family, or perhaps friends. It meant abandoning their way of life. The temple was there, their place of worship. They would have to leave that. If they left it, it would be like turning uh, their holy place over to the Gentiles. And that would have been an outrageous thought for them. Leaving the people, the rest of their people like that, it would have stirred up feelings and concerns of betrayal against them. And so this was a difficult thing for them to do. But the ones that did were spared the horrors that took place there. And so what about you? Do you trust Jesus and do you trust his instructions to us? Now, Jesus gave instructions that seemed kind of counterintuitive to his disciples in that day. But aren't some of the things that Jesus says to us today countercultural? <laughs> I mean, like everything. It's a challenge for us to live the way of Jesus in a world that comes directly against that, right? I mean, think about, think about finances. What does this world tell us about our finances? Make as much money as you can so you can be comfortable and do whatever you want with it. But Jesus says, you know, your finances actually aren't yours. 
You're actually just a steward of the things that I've given to you. Your, your money and your possessions, those are resources that you are to use and to leverage on behalf of the work of the kingdom, what Jesus says for you to do. And so do you trust him at that? Do you trust Jesus enough to say, I'm going to believe that when you say that when I'm generous and I give, that I'm not going to, have, I'm not going to lack, that you're going to provide for me what I need? Are you going to trust him at that? What about, uh, uh, what about sexuality? There's a, there's, there is a, a sexual ethic that is described throughout the scriptures about how sex is uh, confined to the marriage relationship between a man and a woman. Are you going to believe that and accept that? Or are you going to try to redefine that into something that the culture seems more, more, that says is more palatable or something that you think might be more appropriate? Are you going to trust Jesus and obey him or not? Are you going to believe what Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount? When he talks about being uh, um, humble and meek, and when he talks about turning the other cheek, are you, going, are you going to trust those words and find ways to respond with nonviolent uh, retaliation? Or are you going to just take matters in your own hand and defend yourself? Are you going to believe what Jesus says or not? See, in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve didn't trust what God said. They said, you know... You said that we shouldn't eat from that, but that, that tree, but it looks good. It looks pleasing to us. And we're going to redefine things and say, no, that's good for me. And so often what we do in this life is we redefine what God has said is harmful to us. And we say, nah, that's good for me. The question is, are you going to trust him at what he says and believe? Because in the days ahead and the things that we face, what Jesus is looking for is he's looking for people who are going to be obedient and to put their trust in him. Now, not just talking about obedience in this passage, but he's also talking about prayer. If you look at the verses in 19 through 20, Jesus tells them, look at what he says here. He says, pray that this event would not occur in the winter or on the Sabbath. Now, is God God? I mean, he's sovereign, right? He's already, he doesn't he already know when this is going to take place? So why is Jesus telling us to pray that it would happen not on a certain time frame? I mean, Jesus, doesn't he just know that? Couldn't he just say, like, but there's something that's happening here where God is sovereign, he's in control, he has a plan, but then Jesus says, pray that it would work out for you. That's a, it's a strange thing that happens when we talk, start talking about prayer. How do we reconcile this? Uh, I think one of the ways we reconcile this is by using the language of relationships. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught us how to pray. Do you remember how he started it? He said, pray, our Father who art in heaven. So we're to pray to a father. Jesus talks about God and that relationship that he has with him as his father. Now that gets me thinking about me and my kids. Now there's times when we're out, we're, you know, busy doing something and we're on our way home and the plan that the parents have, my wife and I have, our plan is to go home and eat. The plan is to eat because dad's hungry at this point. We've been at a soccer game or a whatever, some kind of event. I'm hungry. I'm getting, you know, a little hangry. I want to eat, right? So that's the plan. But then there's times where my, my boys will say, um, hey, dad, there's a Taco Bell on the way. <laughs> Why don't we stop at the Taco Bell? And not often, but sometimes I'll say, yes, I need some of those uh, very unhealthy uh, nacho fries that they have at Taco Bell, and let's get, some, let's get some nacho fries today. And then my kids do the happy dance in the back of the car, wherever they're sitting, right? So what's happened there? Did they change my will? Well, no, but maybe. I mean, my plan was to go home. My plan was to eat, right? That's the plan. But what did they do? They asked something that was in alignment with my will to eat, and we readjusted the plans, and we ate at Taco Bell instead of making a sandwich at home, okay, or whatever the case may be. And that's what prayer is like. It's when we go to him, and we pray according to his will, and there's times where God's like, all right, you know, we're not going to do it on the Sabbath. We're not going to do that on the winter. But yes, the judgment's coming, but it's going to happen in this way. And here's the, here's the thing, church. We need to be people of prayer. We need to be people that seek God and spend time in his presence that recognize, I don't understand why, but God in his sovereignty says, pray, ask me, come to me with your needs. And that's what we're called to do. I don't understand where God's sovereignty and our requests, where that all changes and how, I don't know all the specific inner workings, but I imagine it's something like a good father saying, let's get some Taco Bell. And there's times, church, where I think we hesitate, like, but no, church, we need to be people of prayer and all so much the more in the days ahead. 
as, as, as there's violence and there's persecution and challenges that are all around us. So he, he talks to us about obedience. He talks to us about a prayer. And then last, he talks about discernment. And we see this here in verses 23 through 28. Now, at the end of the text here, uh, Jesus is warning about false messiahs and rumors of, of uh, a secret return. He talks about the great miraculous works that people do and the signs that they'll perform. And you know, if we're honest today, church, we live in a day and an age where you can go and you can find anybody, someone will say what it is that you want them to say. Like, you know, if, if, if you want to justify your lifestyle and how you're living, I'm sure there's a pastor out there who will justify it for you. You want to hold to a certain belief? Then there's a preacher out there, I'm sure, who, who will preach it. Just Google it. Just look long enough. And if you've got an itch in your ears that you want to be scratched, I'm, I'm pretty confident you can go and just find somebody who will say whatever it is that you want to say. And, and we need to guard against this. We need discernment. You, we need to discern and understand and know what God's word is. You, this is why like, I put a lot of notes in our church center app because I want you Challenge, looking at what I'm saying. You, we need to discern what I'm telling you. You need to discern what others are telling you. We need to be people who take the time to really learn and to know God's word. Uh, what Matthew said there in verse 15, he says, let the reader understand. What's going on there? He assumes, he assumes that the people that he's talking to, that they're so familiar, they're so immersed in Daniel's uh, prophecy that they go, oh, he's talking about Daniel. Yeah, we got that. We understand and church, we need to be the kinds of people that are so immersed in the scriptures that when we hear somebody come up and say, oh, follow me because of this idea or this thought or this theology, we go, oh, wait, that's not right because I know the word. I've spent time in, 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 in the word and, I, and I've, I've studied it. Oh, look, this takes time and it's hard. And, and this is a really countercultural thing because in today's day and age, we don't retain a lot of information, do we? We just go to Google and, we, and we're done with it. But... I believe what we're called to do as followers of Jesus is to, to take God's word and to meditate on it, to consider it, and to learn and to grow from it. Now, it's not just learning God's word, but it's also listening to Jesus's voice. I've talked about this a lot recently because this is something that I'm personally trying to figure out in my life. Man, I just feel like there is so much noise in my life. And I've been able to quiet certain voices here and there. A couple weeks ago, I was joking about my phone screaming at me, you know, all the notifications. I've kind of managed that a little bit. But it just seems like in my life, there's always demands of attention here, give my attention to that, an advertiser, uh, a news article, an alert on my phone, a responsibility that we have. And so many times, all we end up hearing is this cacophony of noise of all these other things in our life. And in church, we've got to find ways to silence those voice, to hear the still small voice of our Savior. That's what we're called to do. And if we don't do that, then we're never going to be able to discern what voice to listen to. We've got to be able to discern the right voices. Otherwise, when these false messiahs come up and say, look how I'm going to save you. Look how I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to provide this for you. Follow me. Give your allegiance to me. We're going to find ourselves following a false messiah and believing our salvation for, in, in that person instead of the real source, which is Jesus. And so church, uh, we've talked about obedience, we've talked about prayer, and we've talked about discipline. And this is what I want to encourage us to do as a way of response today. I want to encourage you to commit yourself to obedience, prayer, and discernment. These three different areas. Find ways this week, and perhaps for some of us, one of these is going to hit more than another for you. But let's be people that are obedient to what God's telling us to do. The people that spend time in his presence and pray Pray for grace. Pray that God would use you to, to, to speak into the lives of the people around you. If not for the, for the elect, then all people would be lost, he said earlier in the passage. God perhaps is wanting to use you to be an agent of grace. And prayerfully, church, we can see those opportunities and make the most of them. But church, let's also be discerning in what we hear. And let's not just believe anything because they've got a book or they've got a TV show or because it sounded nice and it really pleased our ears. But let's be the kind of people that truly discern what God's speaking because we know his word and we've attuned our ear to the voice of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we come to you today in, in what's really kind of a strange passage of scripture. But we recognize today that just as there were instructions that you gave 
to those disciples about the mountain peak ahead of them. We recognize that we face mountain peaks ahead of us as well. And just like you gave instructions that uh, they needed to obey and they needed to be prayerful and they needed to be discerning, Father, I pray that you would help us to incorporate those same things into our hearts and into our lives as well. May we, God, may we be people that are obedient to you. Even when it's hard, even when it's countercultural, when it's not popular, God, I pray that we would be people that, that, that are obedient to what your word calls us to do and to be. God, I pray that you would help us to be people that spend time in your presence in prayer that we would talk to you, that we would hear from you, and that we would be the kinds of people that can be grace, bring grace and peace and hope to the world around us. Give us discernment to know what it is that you've called us to say and to do and to live and to believe. We offer ourselves to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. If you uh, have not received communion yet, I wanna encourage you to go ahead and, um, and get one of those from the back. And um, we're going to participate in communion together today. If you uh, have your communion, you can take the top off where the bread is. Cornerstone, we practice something called open communion. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you are invited to participate with us in this. Communion is a time of reflection. It's a time where uh, maybe we haven't been obedient. And maybe you know that. Maybe you're in the room here today and you're like, yikes, I have not been obedient obedient today, yesterday, the last week, the last month, whatever it is. The the message of the gospel, the good news of the gospel is that there's forgiveness for us. We sang about it earlier. He's faithful. When we're not faithful, he's still faithful. And when we call out to him and repent, he forgives us. And so communion is a time for us to be mindful of that, to confess our sins. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 and 24. For, when, for I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You know, perhaps today you come here and you're just broken. You're broken because of your sin. You're broken because of a diagnosis you've received from a doctor. You're broken because of a relationship. You're, you're broken because of a financial concern. I want you to know that sometimes we look at our life and we're just like, oh, it's just such a mess. Jesus broke his body apart and became a mess with the promise then that he could make our lives whole. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, unfortunately, that here in this life, we always see the healing we want or we're gonna have the money tree grow in the back of our yard or all the relationships are gonna be restored in the way that we want. But what it does mean is that he's going to be faithful with us through these circumstances. And we look forward to the future horizon of the hope of restored life. The brokenness that we experience now, the promise we have in the scriptures is that it will at one point all be made whole. So I just want you, as you hold this here, I just want you to imagine yourself being held in God's hands right now, looking at your broken life, speaking wholeness and love and life into you. Wherever you're at, if you need, if you just, if you're going through it, any of these issues, I just want you to remember God is uh, faithful and he loves you. I want you to know his promise to you is that he is working to make all things new. Let's pray. Jesus, we hold this uh, bread in our hands, this wafer, and we recognize in a similar way, you hold the broken pieces of our life in your hands. You are in control. You are sovereign. The, 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 the wicked may seem like they're winning. The, the, the diagnosis may be bleak. The circumstances might be challenging, but we recognize that we are in the best possible place we can be when we are in your hands because we know that you are in the process of making all things new. So make us new today, we pray. Transform us. Restore us, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's take this together in belief of that. You can take the top or the other side off where the juice is. The apostle Paul writes, he says, in the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Until he comes reminds us of that mountain range again, the greater picture. Look, that's our hope, church. Our hope is not 
in the stuff of this life. How much, like what kind of car we can get or house we can get. Not about who's in the office in the White House. It's not about those issues. It's about until he comes. That's what we're looking forward to. And so when we take this, we just say, oh Jesus, our, our eyes are gonna be fixed and, and we're gonna remember the fact that you're coming and we're gonna live in such a way that points people to it. Let's take this together. Jesus, we commit ourselves to you. We ask that you would speak to us today. Convict us where we need it. I pray for those who are not walking in obedience, that they would take a moment as we reflect now and they would turn their hearts to you. Make us people of prayer and give us discerning minds to know you and to walk faithfully to you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with me? I'm gonna invite our prayer team to come forward. Church, this is a great moment for us to respond. If you wanna come and pray, I wanna encourage you, you can come and kneel at the stairs here and you can pray. If you wanna be prayed for, our prayer team is gonna be up here and they're here to pray for you, whatever need you might have. But let's worship, let's sing this last song, recognizing our need to walk in obedience and in prayer and in discernment. Worship team, would you lead us?
God reigns. We talk about this stuff at the end. This is like, this is good news for us. Now, is there pain and trial in the meantime? Sure, that happens. But hallelujah, our God reigns. He's in control. It's, he's got it all. He knows. He may not have told us all the ins and outs the way we want it, but he is sovereign. He's still in control. And it might seem like the wicked is going to win, but he has a purpose and a plan, and it's all going to turn out right and just in the end. You know, at the beginning, I talked about Zach Morris breaking the fourth wall and, and talking to the audience. And I said, man, I wish, I wish there were times when someone would do that for me. Here's the, here's the good news, church, for us. When we do the kinds of things that Jesus instructed us to do, to be the kinds of people that obey and live counterculturally, the kinds of people that are in prayer, the kinds of people that are discerning, that know his voice, what will happen is there will be opportunities for you in this life to break the fourth wall for the people that you come in contact with. There will be moments where they'll be struggling and they'll be challenged with something. Like, I don't know how you went through that because I'm dealing with this and it's such a difficult situation and you stop and you turn to them. Let the reader understand. You break the fourth wall and you say, let me tell you about my God. Let me tell you about what I know about the future. He's, he reigns, hallelujah. And so church, may you be the kinds of people that break the fourth wall of this crazy, broken, chaotic world and speak words of life and hope because you are the kind of follower of Jesus that, that obeys and prays and has discernment. May you go from this place and make a profound difference on each person that you come in contact with. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace. God bless. Thanks for being here. The worship team's gonna play for a minute. I'll be up here if you wanna talk. We'll see you on Wednesday for our prayer and worship meeting. God bless. Have a great week.